Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We shall have the, uh, the plenary lecture of today. Uh, the plenary lecture is, uh, plenary talk is uh, given by uh, Professor Isabel Lecce. The Dr. Isabel Lecce is an associate professor, ecology and associate scientist of the Institute del Agua at the University of Granada, Spain. She received her doctor degree from this university in 1995 and she was a postdoc, postdoc fellowship at the Institute of Ecosystem Studies until 1998. Since then, she is at the University of Granada. She has been involved in several projects in remote environments as boreal and alpine lakes or in the Southern Ocean. So today's her talk title is Dusty Skies and the Pristine Lakes. Okay, Isabel, please. First off, I want to, to thank the organizing committee for inviting me. And this is a great honor and also a little bit scary. <laughs> I think my stomach is this size right now. But uh, I appreciate very much. As Jim Erser told us, uh, Darwin uh, legacy in biology is so fundamental. However, uh, his um, contribution to the geology field is much less popular, and uh, he actually was a very enthusiastic uh, promoter of his friend Charles Lyell's uh, ideas about an earth changing slowly, gradually, uh, that is an evolving earth. During his voyage uh, in, the, in the bigger, he went through Canary Island and through Cape Verde Island, and this is an area very uh, submitted to very strong Sahara and Sahel uh, dust intrusion. That is something now we know thanks to the satellite imaging, but that was not so clear during his time. In fact, he uh, reported uh, in a paper published in the Quaterly Journal of the Geological Society of London, a paper entitled An Account of the Fine Dust Which Often Falls on the Vessel in the Atlantic Ocean. And, she, and he even was able to collect some of this dust and sent to his colleague, in, in Professor Edinburgh in, in Berlin, Germany. Why dust? Why uh, limnologists and oceanography, oceanographers should to be worried about dust? Actually, soil dust represents f uh, about the 43% of the total aerosol in the atmosphere, even much higher than all the uh, aerosol derived from human activity. More or less half of this dust is uh, coming from the Sahara and Sahel uh, region, and the resident time of this dust in the atmosphere is about five days. So after this uh, storm of dust going to the atmosphere, they travel around for a five, five days and then falling down everywhere, the both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem. That then is not uniformly distributed around the world. The dust display on the air is the bodily depression in Chad, and that produces about two feet of the, of the dust produced by the northern Africa. As you can see here, this is a really nice atmosphere in, in this area. Also, that is not uniformly exported over time. It has a clear seasonal pattern with maximum during late spring and summer, when the intertropical convergence zones is located over the major desert and is leading to massive dust injection into the atmosphere. I'm going to explain this a little bit better. 
During some solar tides, the maximum irradiation on the Earth is located about 23 degrees north. So here is where the, uh, the air is more uh, heating and then goes up and the intertropical convergence zone is moving upward, reaching about the 20 degrees that is located over the Sahara and Sahel regions, Arabia Saudi Peninsula, and due to a very strong continental effect, in the Asia is over the Takrimakan desert and the Gobi. So that means during the near to the summer solstice, the, the intertropical convergence zone, that is the, the warm air is just located, ascended, is located over the major desert on, on the earth. So that means the, the, in, the input of that is very, very strong. We have just the opposite during the, the, win, the winter solstice. During the winter solstice, the maxima irradiation is about 20 de degrees uh, south, and also because a little bit of continental effect, this is a little bit lower in the uh, uh, South, Afri uh, South, South America and uh, Africa. And here is located over the uh, Namibia desert. So that's been the name it global dust belt. This global dust belt is mostly, the most intense is in the another hemisphere, but as I'll tell you now, that is moving back, upward, downward, depending on the, uh, of the month of the year. Now I'm going to show you a uh, year uh, changing in this dust, the position and the intensity. So, the red color means more dust in the atmosphere. This is uh, aerosol index is mostly due to, to dust. So please pay attention to the movement of the, of the belt as well as the, the red colors. So this is January, February going up, April and go more intense as it's reaching the, the summer source tides, and you can see here, as I told you before, the maximum export of dust is during uh, late spring and, and summer, because this intertropical convergence zone is located over the Sahara and Sahel region, Arabia Saudi, and Taklimakan uh, desert. Now, goes down again as the year develops. So, and during December, during the solstice, winter solstice, we have much less dust in the southern hemisphere, but also some dust due to the Namibia desert and Australia desert. The export of dust from Sahara and Sahel is mostly driving by the, the eastern lights, so the winds coming from the, from the east to the west, transporting this dust from the African coast to crossing the, the Atlantic Ocean and reaching the Caribbean and the Amazonia. Also, it's transported to the Mediterranean Basin under meteorological condition, the particular meteorological condition, as is lower pressure around Portugal and high pressure in the northern of Africa that channelize all this data to the Mediterranean Basin and many countries in Europe. And for the case of the dust exported from the Taklimakan and uh, Gobi Desert, the, is the western light, so the, the, the winds go from the, from the west to the east, and the, the, the dust arriving to the Japan Sea, Yellow Sea, and to the Pacific Ocean too. But over exposed to these seasonal uh, patterns, there is also some climatic forcing, such as the atmospheric oscillation. So positive uh, os uh, atmospheric, os not, not Atlantic atmospheric oscillation, that means more dust in the atmosphere. And also, it's also related over larger uh, time scale with the changes in the land use as well as the droughts. In, in the Sahel regions. In the, in the scale of uh, centuries, as you can see here, the red line, during the last two centuries, the increase 
of this uh, DAS export some has been related with the uh, onset of commercial agriculture, agriculture in, in the Sahel region. And in the decade scale, the red line two also is increasing this dust export, is increasing mostly related with the Sahel droughts. So, dust distribution is heterogeneous around the world as well as in Spain, in space and in time. This dust is traveling around the world, mostly in the, in the northern hemisphere, and reaches some um, everywhere, so also to Pristine Lake. Pristine Lake, since they are very far away from, from human activity, they are considered uh, a sensor of, they are very sensitive to environmental changes, so they are like uh, freshwater reference sites, so it's good to, to have this kind of system to, to have a kind of control of the, of the more pristine condition. So, in late 90s, I read this paper and was a kind of inspiration because we always, we have been having in the south of Spain always this kind of dust storm, but, you know, and we have been working a lot in, in high mountain lake, but we never actually feel like this is something important for the lakes. So, one, I read this paper by, by Roland Senner, oh, I thought, oh, maybe this can have some effect. This dust arriving to, to the lakes can be really important. So, we has been, this has been one of my research lines, the main research line in, in the last time. That is, but you can see the impact of this dust is something really strong. This is a picture of the Austrian Alp before and after one of these dust storms. We have been exploring this seasonal pattern I, I told you before, mostly in, in Sierra Nevada, National Park, this is here. This area is pretty close to the north of Africa, so we receive this dust storm very, very often, and mostly in summer when the, the lakes are uh, uncovered of ice. So at the same time we are sampling the lakes, we, we also sample the, the, the atmosphere, the, we collect this sample for, for dust, we used to do two types of collector, passive collector. That is to get the actual uh, rate of deposition. So this is sedimentation of particle. And this can be dry. Usually people, most people have been studying bulk deposition. That is they mix both dry and, and wet. But mostly for arid and semi-arid uh, countries is really important. We, we found dry deposition is the most, in, the most relevant uh, kind of deposition. So we, we discriminate between dry and wet deposition. This kind of, of device has a humidity sensor that cover and uncover the, the bucket, so depending on if it's raining or not. And the, the unit is per meter square and day and dependent on the, the parameter you, you have. Also, we have been using active collector. This active collector has here some filter, so they actively filter the air. And you can see here in this picture, this is a filter collected under normal condition, and this is one of the filters when we have one of these Saharan dust intrusions. <clears throat> We started with the chemistry, how, you know, how the, the, uh, the, lake, the lake chemistry can be affected by, by this dust deposition. And one of the things we found was actually the calcium deposition have the same seasonal pattern than that export with maximum during late spring and summer. And also, that deposition, uh, calcium deposition was very well correlated with uh, calcium in the lake. And that was really important because you have to keep in mind this lake are uh, of in, in a silicate substrate. So that means you are not expected to have uh, calcium there, you are expected to have low alkalinity. However, this lake have much higher alkalinity than is expected to, to, to this type of system. 
Also, we went to, to analyze the, the, the major nutrients like phosphor and nitrogen, and phosphor is coming mostly in, in dry fall, and also you can see here with a clear pattern similar to that export, with maximum during late spring and summer. Also, we found chlorophyll A in this alpine lake is very well correlated with the deposition of this phosphor. Okay, maybe phytoplankton is response to, to this uh, phosphor input, so we decide maybe bacterioplankton is also responding to this. So we related the atmospheric deposition with the bacteria abundant in this alpine lake, and we, we found many of these lakes fit well with the atmospheric deposition. But to discriminate if this is a direct or an indirect influence due to to the effect on primary producer, producer we set up several experiments when we, when we have uh, dust directly, the dust, put the dust in the same concentration you can find in, in, in one of these intrusions. And as you can see here, this is the treatment with dust and this is the treatment without dust. So bacteria respond directly to this dust input. Okay, next. Oh, we get so excited, so bacterial response, but maybe there are coming a lot of organic matter with the, with the, with the dust. So we start to analyze the organic matter who is transported with this dust, so we discriminate between uh, water-soluble organic matter and insoluble. So that's by filtration. As you can see here, the absorption, we characterize this dissolved organic matter, and the absorption here is much higher when the, the, the position is coming from the Sahara than when the, the position is coming mostly from air masses from marine uh, origin. But it's not just more color, it's also more humic-like substances. We also use these uh, matrices to, to see how the, to they characterize them qualitatively. So as you can see here, this organic matter, when the, the dust is coming from the, when the atmospheric deposition is coming from the Sahara, is mostly humic like substance. However, when the, 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 the atmospheric deposition is coming from marine sources, it's mostly amino acid-like. In fact, we were, were, we were able to found Total deposition in the, in the lakes was very well, total deposition normalized by DOC was related with the organic carbon in this alpine system. This, just keep in mind this alpine system, they have almost no catchment areas. It's just like atmospheric collectors. Also, one of these uh, parafac um, compounds we were a, a semi-quinone compound, we were able to trace in the lake. So the, uh, the deposition of this compound was very well correlated with this compound in the lake. So we get so excited about this idea of organic matter com coming with the dust, and we decide to, uh, to analyze this in, in not just a time scale, you also go to a spatial scale. So we set up a, a project with more ambitious so, and we select several alpine sites uh, located inside the, the dust belt. That is the Atlas, Pirine, uh, Sierra Nevada and Pyrenees in, in Spain and the Austrian Alps. So it's a gradient inside the, the, the dust belt. Patagonia with a minor influence of pampa dust as well as two polar systems that has control out of the dust influence. What see is here, in effect, the aerosol index, so the, the content of dust, is decreasing as latitude increases, as also we have here the concentration of DOC and the quality of DOC, this is the absorption and the fluorescence, decrease as latitude increase. 
So that means DOC concentration, absorbance, fluorescence, and spectra slow decrease uh, uh, with latitude inside this dust belt. So dust input increase lay alkalinity, increase phosphoroviability, stimulate phytoplankton and bacteria directly, and also increase the chromophoric organic matter with some implication for water transparency. So we, we want to follow with this and we decide, oh, maybe dust is also carrying some microorganisms attached to, the, to this dust particle. So we decide to analyze, to try to, to, to see if there are some microorganisms attached to this dust. We want to see if these microorganisms are alive when they arrive to the lakes. So we analyze the viability of these microorganisms and who they are. The first thing we did was set up a um, procedure and technique to detach dust, uh, these microorganisms, bacteria and viruses from the dust particle. So we, we put in the sample, we ran uh, sample without treatment, uh, uh, with a treatment with like detergents like pyrophosphate and twin twin and shaking and sonication to detach these microorganisms from the dust. Then we send, uh, generate a gradient of, uh, of density, centrifugate, and we get a cell layer when we took this sample from here and then go to the flu cytometry to analyze the bacteria abonda and the virus abonda. As you can hear here, when we compare the untreatment uh, sample with the detached, you can see here we get two other of magnitude of bacteria deposition and virus deposition with the detached sample done in the untreatment sample. And the um, atmospheric deposition bacteria ranging from 3 to 85 million of bacteria per meter cubic per day. And virus like almost 300 to more than 7,000 mil, million, millions of bacteria per, uh, of virus per meter square and day. We have several collectors in different positions in, in this system. So near to one of the peaks in Sierra Nevada, Beleta Peak, another in the observatory of the astrophysics. And then, as you can see here, for both, for bacteria and virus, we get a very nice uh, synchrony. That means that is something more on regional scale. Also, we analyze there is some easier pattern to, to, to see if there are any kind of, of correlation. As you can see here, bacteria deposition were related with the water insoluble organic carbon, that is the fraction which was retained on the filter, and viruses, which are much smaller, were very well correlated with the water-soluble organic carbon. Then we want to see if, you know, we know there are many bacteria coming with the dust, there are so many uh, viruses coming with the dust, but they are alive because they can be just uh, during this travel through the atmosphere, they can just... Uh, have a lot of UV, so they can be that. So we, we set up several experiments with two different types of dust. We took dust in, in the Pyrenees, uh, aerosol from the Pyrenees, and we also have dust directly from the origin. So we have dust from Mauritania, and uh, we grow this with uh, lake water sterile. So this is just to see if the, the microorganisms that are carrying with the dust are alive. So we also have put this uh, dust to the natural condition in the lakes, in the several lakes in the Pyrenees, and try to summarize here all the results. And you can see here, we found uh, this is the bacteria grown in the dust, in the aerosol uh, collected in Pyrenees. This is directly from the soil of Mauritania. As you can see here, there are a lot of microorganisms are cosmopolitan, so they can live without the, the natural uh, bacteria. And 
without the bacteria. And also there are some soil, of, of course this is mostly soil uh, aerosols, so who, live, who are alive, and also we found some freshwater, long-range, airborne microorganisms. So bacteria and virus deposition rate have relevant magnitude. There is a high viability of soil and aquatic bacteria in pristine, lake, in pristine waters, and both soil and aquatic bacteria are long-range transported attached to the dust particle. One second. Going back to the beginning of, of my talk, as I told you before, uh, Darwin was able to collect this data during his voyage uh, in the and he sent some samples to Professor Ehrenberg, who examined this, sam this sample of dust, and he found 67 different forms of infusoria, that is protozoa. So, for me, this is just amazing how this, this man was able to collect this, to send it to this microbiology in, in, in Berlin, and, and they were so excited to, to see there are so many uh, infusoria there. But even more, more exciting for me is more recently, uh, Anna Gorbushina had the opportunity to analyze the dust of Darwin, and she found uh, in the electronic microscopy, in the fluorescent microscopy, there are microorganisms, but even more, these microorganisms were alive. She was able to grow some fungi as well as some bacteria. So al after almost two centuries, there are so much life inside the dust of the Darwin. So thank you for your attention. Arigato. Her talk is now open to discussion. Any questions or comments? <laughs> I may have to go back. <laughs> I was. I, I have a question. Oh, please, please. May please I? come to the microphone. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. I was. Is, Isabella, it was a wonderful talk and really interesting. Did, did you, do you think that there are big changes going on in the dust composition due to anthropogenic uh, forcing changing to landscape use over time? Uh, yes, there are some, some changes. We have been also analyzed how uh, pollution affects this dust. So we have sample in Sierra Nevada but also we have some, Granada is not a big city, but have some pollution. So we also have some collector down in on town, and we have uh, also tried to, uh, to see directly how is the combustion of the diesel, how it's affecting the, when it's uh, together with the dust. So, and also uh, in Spain sometimes this is pretty frequent, this, this dust storm is pretty frequent, and uh, the, comb the, the diesel, Combustion plus the dust affects a lot the respiratory tract, and is a lot of people are having more and more uh, allergies and respiratory problems and all this. Thing. So it's affecting. So it's all together. <laughs> Do you have a question or comments? Oh, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to. <laughs> In the first part of your talk, you showed bacterial activity in lake water increasing with the arrival of dust particles. And then the second part, we learn that there are bacteria on the dust particles. So my question then is, is this increase due to the lake bacteria responding to arrival of the dust, or the dust bacteria being rehydrated? Uh, both. <laughs> but uh, mostly is the bacteria, the, the lag time to, to bacteria coming from the dust takes on like a couple of days to, to start to, to grow. So uh, I guess the, the, the autochthonic bacteria react more faster than the bacteria who are carried with the dust. So it's like there is a lag time 
phase, but both response. So the, we have some experiment, but it was too long to, to explain here, but we have some experiment of the ability to colonize these two, you know, these invaders colonize the, the, the system. But I decided don't put this because I like more the idea of the life in the, in the dark, in the dust of Darwin. So <laughs> I put out of this own experiment. Yeah. <laughs>